Good evening, everyone. Um, in a few minutes, the Nintendo Hacking 2016 talk will start. Um, this talk will be translated into German, and there are English subtitles available. Anyway, without much further ado, um, these are Derek, Neerwert, and Netwil. The three students have been working on hacking the Nintendo platform for a while now, and please give them a warm applause. Um, hi guys, so uh, we'll come to our talk about Nintendo Hacking 2016. Let me quickly introduce the other guys. This is Derek and that's Ned. And I think I can speak for all the, the three of us to say that I'm really happy that you guys are here today and we are happy that we can be here today to tell you everything about what we did in the past one and a half years, I guess. So I will start with the state of the Wii U. Um, I hope a lot of you guys have seen Fail of a Flow's talk in 2013 about hacking the Wii U. Not much happened afterwards. Uh, until 2015, there is a public WebKit exploit released. And um, about at this time, we started looking into the Wii U. And we wanted more access, right, than just user mode. Um, because there is also the kernel running on a power PC. And then there is this other ARM processor that runs IOSU also user mode and kernel mode. I'm not going to consider the user mode to, today because I think the kernel exploits are just way more fun. Um, so let's start with PowerPC kernel real quick. It has all standard basic security measures, though it doesn't have any ASLR, which makes our life easier. Uh, it has about 140 syscalls. Um, and we don't really, we, we can't really name them from start, right? Kind of need to reverse it, but there's a nice thing. So the Wii U uses this RPL mechanism for dynamic libraries, and there's this really nice library, it's called coreinit.rpl, and it contains a lot of syscall shims and symbol names, so we can, we can name all the syscall calls straight away without much hassle. And uh, it's important to note that all the syscalls use a safe copy-in, copy-out mechanism to get data from the user space into the kernel space. So you start reversing each call and uh, you start looking for bugs. And what we came up with at first this is what we call IO control V hacks, or why indirections are hard. It's actually a bug in the IPCK driver submit request syscall. So, what this syscall is used for is you want to submit requests from user mode to this other processor running, which I'm going to talk about later. And uh, so you submit these kind of request structures and uh, the kernel uses copy in to fetch the request structure from user mode into kernel mode, but there is a certain type of request structure which uh, contains an indirection, like a second layer, right? And, uh, well, they just ignore that for the second level and hope for the best. So let's look at the relevant part. I'm really sorry I'm showing you this code here, but it's not much more than that. So there is something that's called IOS packet in the second line, which is kind of this request that we submit from user mode into kernel mode. And in the top line, there's this special request entry. So it contains a physical address, a buffer size, and a virtual address. And what we do from user mode is we submit it filled out with the virtual address and the size. And the kernel does this convenient thing of us for us to um, kind of change the virtual address to the physical address. So we can see it copies in this packet from user mode into kernel mode using the save mechanism, and then it goes through all the entries and fixes up the physical addresses for us. But we can see in this line that it doesn't use the save mechanism at all. It doesn't care about whatever address we put in there. So this gives us some kind of write primitive to wherever we want, basically. Um, this looks hard to exploit, right? Because the write kind of is going through this conversation, but we actually only need one byte to exploit the kernel. And uh, we do this by noting that this ki effective to physical conversion function actually returns zero for any garbage input we get. And uh, there's a pretty high chance of the input to the function to be in garbage if we point it to any part inside kernel data. So the strategy here is 
that we go into the syscall handler address table, and uh, we overwrite the last byte for one particular syscall handler, and we hope that the new address actually points to some usable gadget. So we hope for the best, basically. And uh, the other important thing to note here is that our user mode code is running from what we call the JIT area. And what's really stupid is that the JIT area is actually executable from kernel mode for some reason. So that's nice too. Okay, look at the, let's look at the relevant structures. So this is the kernel, and we should read this from the bottom to the top. Okay, like in the last line in the bottom, we see this entry to ke loader call. And then we can look at the last byte there. It's hex f0. And um, what we will do now is overwrite this last byte with zero. And what happens is uh, that now the syscall will actually point to this very usable gadget up there where it loads this register R28 into the link register and just branches there. And the nice thing is that we control R28 from user mode. So this gives us a way to just jump anywhere, basically. So how do we exploit this? Well, we have our k-mode function there. And then we just call IR control v to this uh, shifted address. And from this point on, we have this nice uh, syscall that just jumps to anywhere we want. And then we call it, basically, and this calls our k-mode function. So the Wii U starts out with full four hearts. And uh, this gives us PowerPC mode code execution. So we subtract one heart. Um, it's quite nice, but we can and need to go deeper. Um, for that, let's look at the IOSU architecture. So IOSU is present as one big L file, and this includes the kernel and all the services. And uh, it's running on the Starbuck. It uh, has a hardware way to enforce no execute, and again, no ASLR, making our lives easier. And uh, it's a microkernel design and has about 140 syscalls. So, um, Another thing to notice is that the kernel spawns all the services as user mode processes. So before we can exploit the kernel, we actually have to exploit one of these user mode processes, which we did, but I'm not going to talk about. And um, to look into the kernel, we again reverse all of these syscalls and search for bugs. And uh, what we came up with is called mqhex or message qhex. It contains another nice bug class that apparently never dies, integer overflows. And uh, let's look at the code again. So there's the syscall, it's called create message queue. You pass it a buffer and the number of buffer entries. And what they assumed was that each buffer entry is four bytes. So when they check the address range, they just multiply the number of entries with four bytes. So does anyone see the integer overflow here? And uh, <laughs> the other nice thing is that they just use the number of entries for the maximum number of entries for the message queue. And uh, our write primitive, again, is a descent message syscall. So I told you about this hardware NX, right? So iOS should be enforcing that no executable memory is writable. And uh, if you look at the kernel section flags, we actually see that kernel text is read execute and kernel data is read write. But these permissions are all lies, OK? So our exploit strategy. Well, let's look at the relevant part of the ISU kernel. So we see that kernel text starts at this lower address at hex 812. And conveniently for us, there is a syscall there. And the addresses before that are all valid. So we create a message queue um, starting at minus eight bytes. And this magic hex 400 whatever two number. And from this point on, we just push two messages and then ARM instruction to branch R3. And what this does is it actually causes the start of the text section to be overwritten with branch R3. And let's just look at the integer overflow, right? Four times this value, truncated to four bytes, gives eight bytes. So what the kernel thinks is that the message queue is only eight bytes, but we can just push any messages we want, okay? So this gives us IRS kernel mode execution. And uh, the nice thing about this is, that we actually have full control over the console now, right? So we can dump the console's OTP, which contains all the keys, except for boot one, which we will coming back to later, because unfortunately the keys for boot one are locked out, as we've already seen. And 
Now we want to make everything persistent. So how do we do that? Um, we find that title content is only verified at title install time, but never at boot time. Because at boot time, they only verify the title binary. So what you can do is you can actually start to mess with the metadata of titles and overwrite it. And what we did was to overwrite uh, the ROM for a DS game, exploited the emulator, and got user mode code execution again. And uh, another thing is the console contains this config file, which tells it into, to put into, into which title to put. So what you can do is you overwrite the title ID with your modified uh, DS emulator title, and the next time you start up the console, it actually boots into the exploited game, and uh, yeah. So this gives us persistent code execution and cold boot with full control over the console whatsoever. So game over. So um, as we just saw, um, the kernels are like pretty broken, right? So uh, what is missing? And uh, I just copied uh, this slide from uh, Fail Overflow's t uh, talk. As you can see, we are using the same default team, uh, theme for our slides. And um, basically, uh, the boot one key, which is the second stage bootloader uh, on Wii U, uh, this key is uh, still unknown, and they tried uh, to get it somehow with um, with uh, some side channel attack thing, but I think it uh, never worked. So it would be nice uh, to get this key. And um, the first thing uh, we did was to make an end tracer, so we can basically hit, um, sniff all the traffic uh, from uh, between NAND and would want to see what would one it, what would one reads from Flash, and uh, so we get some nice addresses, and uh, we could uh, compare this with the um, file system on this Flash to see what file it is reading, and we also kind of messed around uh, with um, some files on this uh, file system, and we found out that would one actually parses uh, a file that is called System XML. And I don't know, it doesn't really uh, feel safe uh, to parse an XML file in uh, such a uh, really early boot process. I mean, um, there's a lot of stuff that um, could go wrong. So uh, we tried to um, attack this. Um, we tr uh, tried some client exploitation stuff. But yeah, unfortunately, it didn't really work. So uh, let's try something else. So uh, there's boot one, uh, which of course uh, boots uh, this, sorry. Uh, we've got boot zero, and um, this boots boot one, and fail overflow found out that uh, this uh, boot zero, which is uh, the boot ROM of the security processor, can be re-enabled again in virtual remote, and you can just dump it. So let's look at boot one, uh, boot zero, sorry. And we can see that it um, reads the boot one key from OTP, and then it locks out uh, boot one key for error. And this happens really early. Uh, but it's basically kept in memory all the time until it's done, uh, until it uh, has launched a boot one or uh, just panicked. So uh, this means that we have to exploit boot zero uh, to get the boot one key. And unfortunately, boot zero is pretty safe. It's kind of surprising because this is a Wii U. And um, basically, uh, this gives us this question, how can you exploit something that has no bugs? So the answer is uh, we have to introduce our own bugs. <laughs> and we are doing this by using fault injection. And maybe you have uh, heard of it already. It's Basically, you introduce an error uh, into the device by uh, glitching the clock or voltage, uh, the reset line. You can also do electromagnetic fault injections. There are many ways. But um, basically, what you want to get is a uh, mutated uh, instruction um, or an instruction skip or some corrupted registers. 
And what you don't want is uh, just a stupid uh, lockup uh, where it just crashes. And yeah, that's not really useful. Um, so we want to glitch uh, boot zero. And uh, to do this, we have to find a nice target, like the weak spot of uh, boot zero. So let's take a look what boot, boot zero does. Uh, the first thing it does is uh, it copies itself to RAM for some unknown reason. I mean, there's no good reason to do this, but it's nice for us uh, because it copies uh, it, itself to RAM and just executes uh, from there. And then it copies the uh, boot one key to memory. Um, it locks out the OTP slot, initializes some other stuff in flash controller. And then it starts reading uh, the boot one image. And it does that um, by just reading uh, its header to this address. And then they read the size uh, from the header field. And they also do some uh, max size check on this. And please note, um, the header itself is uh, not encrypted. And they also don't do uh, any uh, signature verification um, uh, here at this step. So um, they use the size and read uh, the whole uh, boot one image using uh, the size, and then they do a real signature verification, make sure that the image is not corrupted. It then decrypts the boot one code using the key from RAM, and then it clears the key and jumps to the boot one entry point. Okay, so what is the weak spot here? And I mean, if you look at this, you can pretty much already tell what it is. And of course, it's uh, this size check. So um, what we can do is we can write uh, our own modified version of boot one to flash uh, with some really, really large size uh, in the header. So um, it reads the header and then it's supposed to do uh, the size check. And this is exactly where we want to glitch it. And eventually, it um, will just skip uh, the instruction or something else happens. And then basically, the size check is bypassed. So when it's reading the wood one image using this size, it will actually overflow the buffer. And we have some uh, jump instructions at the end. So when it returns from the flash read function, it will uh, eventually jump to our code. And this is actually boot zero code execution. <laughs> okay, so we have uh, boot zero code execution, and you know, we can just uh, dump the boot one key from RAM. And we didn't even need an exploit for this, right? So it's just, uh, boot zero is actually pretty safe, right? But when it comes to glitching, it's kind of fragile because uh, boot zero code is writable and also the boot one uh, image buffer is in front of a boot zero buffer so we can just overflow it. And also the setup uh, that I had uh, is surprisingly stable. So it works like 50% of, uh, of the entire time. So let's finally look at boot one. And uh, boot one is able to understand the VEU file system. It uses real uh, file path uh, strings to load the firmware image. And of course, the uh, first thing we did was uh, to look at the uh, XML parser. And well, unfortunately, it seems pretty safe. Um, yeah, but. Uh, maybe we found a bug, we are not really sure, and we haven't really tried to exploit it. Uh, interest kind of faded out, because, you know, it's, uh, after all, it's just a Wii U. <laughs> so, that's it for Wii U, and now I will hand over to Ned Will. He's talking about 3DS.
Hey everyone, uh, I'm Ned. I started 3DS this year, and uh, I'm basically a software person, so I'm gonna be showing some of the homebrew side of 3DS, where that's at right now. So just to reiterate from last year, uh, these guys broke userland kernel and security processor. Uh, they also broke the secret hardware key scrambler. And um, since then, Nintendo's been kind of mad about this. They released a lot of system updates. <laughs> and they started a bug bounty program. So uh, there's a lot of bugs getting patched, but uh, because of the amount of, the level of exploitation we got last year, uh, it's actually really easy to find new bugs and new exploits. So uh, what I wanna emphasize here is that um, even though it's like a cat and mouse game, because we have so much control, we can exploit more difficult bugs uh, on the latest firmware. So. Uh, starting with user space, uh, this is where all homebrew comes from. So um, already it's pretty good, like this has always been a, a huge focus uh, for the homebrew community because uh, uh, it's kind of where, you know, user space is where you want to be running your own custom games, you know, modifying stuff. So uh, we have a bunch of uh, game entry points and a bunch of browser exploits, but there's a couple limitations to these. And that's that uh, game carts uh, cost money and they frequently are, like the games that are exploited are usually somewhat rare and unusual. And so uh, the price goes way up as demand soars. And for the browser, every time we release a new uh, browser exploit, Nintendo can actually enforce that you're on the latest firmware because before we uh, fetch any web page, it'll check that the, uh, the system's on the latest version. So they can kind of remotely cut off uh, web browser exploits. So um, looking at this, I thought it might be fun to look at if any of the system titles could be exploitable as primary entry points. And I found something called sound hacks. Um, so just the basic, like the two probably most obvious things to look at are the image loader because it's got JPEG parsing and also the music player. Uh, but when I looked at the music player, I saw that they're parsing actually a lot of formats and they, they even have their own custom playlist format. And if they make a single mistake anywhere, it's, uh, it's over. So um, then I, I was trying to compare with like open source implementations. I didn't find any overlap. Uh, it seemed like everything was custom. So that was pretty promising. Um, so over the course of about a month, I found a, a bunch of bugs and um, I was trying to like chain together little like logical bugs and it wasn't really working and then I just found one that was really critical. So uh, I'm gonna demonstrate that here. So I actually studied MP3 for like the whole month, MPEG was like the last day. So I looked at it and they actually malloc uh, 256 byte buffer for the song name and then when they go to load it, if they see a Unicode uh, bomb marker, they just mem copy the thing. And that tag size is totally controlled. So, you know, that's, that's it. So, <laughs> so this is like, this is pretty great, but it's a heap exploit, so it's a little tricky, but this is what it looks like. Uh, so we have our name chunk that we're about to overflow. And then, um, like, I'm a CTF player, so I just put A's there, and then, uh, the next thing that happens is this gets freed. And so um, this victim chunk that we've overridden, it's actually um, the way the 3DS heap works, they actually track, um, they have a linked list of what things are currently allocated. So this gives us the classical heap on link arbitrary write. And so uh, at this point we have a four byte write and we wanna get ROP out of it. So um, we'll probably do a stack pivot. Um, so I looked at the binary and there's only one pivot gadget and then I looked at the, the thumb pivots, there are actually a lot, but because this CP was too old, it uh, didn't support the wide instructions that where all the uh, pivots come up. So um, unfortunately that one pivot instruction has some like arithmetic conditions on it. Um, specifically it was that uh, in order to you know, load all your registers from memory. Um, 
the condition flags had to satisfy less than. And everywhere where we returned from the function, it, it had just checked that, um, like, if this pointer is not null, free it. And, and so the comparisons wouldn't ever be satisfied because uh, nothing's mapped up in a negative area. So, of course, CTF workarounds. Uh, we can still do this. So, um, I would overwrite the uh, heap free list head with a stack address. Um, and so, on the next malloc, we just return that stack address and read into it. So, um, there's a couple of constraints on this. And uh, the first one's really normal. Like, this is every pivot to stack heap thing. Uh, you have to make sure that you have a heap chunk on the stack. Uh, and luckily, this is actually uh, pretty easy because all you need is a size followed by uh, two null pointers representing next and previous. So when malloc goes to look there, it sees like the size is big enough and then nothing else is in the queue, so we'll just return this. And then uh, this worked. So we mem copy the next tag to the stack and like we just specify that size and malloc and reads it in for us. And then from there we're done because we can just uh, do a little a little wrap chain where we mem copy the shell code to the heap and then use an existing exploit uh, GS pwn, which has been around for a long time, uh, to overwrite the text section and, and jump there. So there's the first heart. Um, so you can't really talk about homebrew without also talking about kernel because we. Uh, want to get access to more syscalls. Like the 3DS actually sandboxes a lot of the syscalls away from you. And so as an attacker, uh, well, your, your goal is to call some syscalls that are restricted. Um, a really nice example would be you'd want to map some executable memory for like a JIT emulator. So um, it's kind of a tricky situation because you're inside the sandbox, you want to break out. You have to find bugs in like pretty restricted syscalls. So, um, I looked at last year's talk here and uh, like what had been done so far and it seemed like there were a lot of attacks on the memory mapping. Uh, but I didn't see much about the sync primitives or anything related to use after free. And uh, I had just got a pretty bad grade on my uh, OS project because I had a lot of those. So I knew this is a good place to look. Uh, so I noticed the design flaw when I was reversing the uh, ref counting. Uh, so it's not so much that they couldn't possibly get this right, but uh, generally when you're desi designing an API, you wanna make it really hard to abuse, and uh, this is just not really true for how they do ref counting. So I'll go ahead and bring all these up. Yeah, so basically, they, whenever the user fetches um, a kernel object to perform some operation on it, meaning you call a syscall that does something using a kernel object, it does the correct ink ref and then uh, deck ref for you. But um, I was looking at it and I was thinking, well, like a lot of times the kernel actually is using these objects internally to do stuff. So, I mean, I spoiled it, but like, I mean, it was like a week, I, I found like three user for freeze, uh, and they're all following the same pattern. Uh, the kernel is using an object internally without uh, maintaining the reference count correctly. And then uh, some people asked me like advice on kernel hacking, maybe like at home, I definitely recommend looking here. I'm sure that there's plenty more. So the one I'm gonna talk about today is the, the timer object. Um, so this is a pretty simple API with the kernel. You can have it create a timer for you. Um, and you can set the timer, you can wait on it. It's, it's like a normal synchronization primitive. Um, so like I said, I was looking for these uh, use after freeze. I saw this and I thought it's kind of interesting that this one called pulse is uh, is here because what's what's happening with this one is uh, when uh, you set the timer to pulse, like every period, it's um, signaling everything that's waiting on it, and then it like resets itself, and then if you wait on it, the next period comes around, you, you signal again, and so I was thinking like it's definitely doing some stuff with this object um, internally that's like a bit more complicated than some of the other modes and the other uh, kernel objects. So I looked at how they did the pulse, uh, like, you know, every, uh, every second or whatever when it pulses, like what's actually getting executed. And uh, if you look here, they uh, do some pretty good locking and then uh, they signal. 
And then what happens here is basically when they signal, they go through and everyone that was waiting gets um, uh, rescheduled, uh, made runnable. And then at the end, they reset the timer state and just say like, okay, everyone that waits on this again has to wait for the next uh, cycle. Um, so, and then this also looks pretty good. Like they, they're locking the scheduler here. Um, and this would work, but uh, nothing's preventing you from just closing this uh, from another core. So um, I have fast hacks, which is just three syscalls. Is that, that's it, that's the entire exploit. And there's a lot of setup, which we'll get to. But you just create the timer, set it to run really fast, and then close the handle, and then if it was pulsing and you closed it, it'll use after free. So what's nice about this is uh, if you lose the race, it just, the timer is just unscheduled, you're fine. And then uh, it actually happens quite often, and I didn't even really specifically try to win this too well. Like I just, once it was within a second, um, I didn't worry, but those parameters are probably not optimal. Uh, so we should look at how do we exploit this. Uh, basically, um, this is the, a little bit more complicated view of it. I'll, I'll show a diagram in a second. But this is like where the use after free actually happens. So I, like R7 is pointing to my timer object, and then it was freed before we reached this uh, chunk here. And then it's loading R7 to R0, uh, loading something from that, and then uh, branching to it. So that's like calling a use after free uh, object. So this is pretty exploitable on the 3DS kernel because uh, they use a slab heap to um, deal with allocating the objects. So this is the normal situation when that first timer is allocated. Um, the vtable is pointing to the, you know, the real K timer vtable, and then it wants to call that timer reset function. Uh, it's totally fine, but when we free it, it actually, um, that vtable pointer goes to the next freed timer object in the kernel. So it's actually interpreting that struct as, uh, as a vtable. And what's nice is uh, it actually overlaps with the initial timer value that uh, we totally control. Um, so it looks like, okay, we could just set the initial timer value, you know, do this use after free and we're just calling user space. Um, that's what I thought, and then I realized it wasn't that easy. So, um, because the race, like, because of what's actually calling this is in a kernel thread, we actually can't guarantee that uh, our user process is actually mapped in memory, and in fact, it's on a different core, so um, even if you open a process on the other core, like, open, like ran a thread there, um, you can't get more than 25% of the time, I think, so uh, that's just super unstable. Um, also, because it's a kernel thread, we don't necessarily want to crash it. Uh, we don't like crashes in general, but this will just totally break everything if the timer like sync thread dies. So um, as long as we return to a function, do something cleanly in return, it'll be fine. So uh, it sounds like, okay, all we have to do is find some kernel function we can call and we're done. But there's actually another issue, and that's that uh, kernel code is mapped at high addresses, and these are uh, actually negative. And the set timer syscall actually checks if your timer is negative. Um, so there's a pretty funny trick I found, and it's that uh, when you set the timer, you're saying like, you know, start uh, like one second from now, start pulsing. Um, obviously, it's it's adding like the current time to the one second to know like when do I trigger this timer. So uh, so set timer is the one that does that ad for you. Um, they don't check for overflow when installing it. And timer schedule values are signed, which is also a bit weird. Um, so we can overflow and schedule into the past. Uh, so how this looks is, uh, that's my like disgusting uh, setup call. Uh, so what's happening is like in the middle, that's the start of the 3DS boot, um, and then that range on the right is what the 3DS will allow you to pass for your values for uh, the initial and uh, like pulse uh, period time. Um, and so what I do is I just uh, put it right there at the end and then it overflows. And then on the next pulse, um, I also control that and that's also less than that range. So then we can get it to line up on the kernel address that we want. And so, 
that's uh, pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, we're at the end. Like at this point, it's it's pretty solid, but there isn't like an obvious single thing we can call. Um, and it seems like well, maybe you could race a bunch of times and call a bunch of different things in the kernel, and like, you know, that's a decent amount of control. But because of all this weird uh, negative scheduling stuff, it's actually pretty hard to do multiple um, multiple calls. So I was trying to look for one thing that I can call that will uh, give me control. And uh, this is where it gets really tricky. So um, if we look at how the memory mapping on 3DS works, uh, in user space, you can access the FC RAM, which is that first range up there. Um, that's just where you know, your heap goes there. And then the kernel also has a view of this heap. Uh, it's, you know, it's a shared mapping, so um, if we can write one of those, uh, something in that range into the free pointer and allocate it, it actually ends up in something we can see as the user. So then I noticed this. Um, this is actually a common instruction prefix in ARM. So uh, I jumped here, and uh, at this point, like we just did a C++ uh, view table call on the use after free thing with one argument. So this means that R0 contains the address of the object, and R1 contains the address of where we just jumped to. So that uh, like B65C is uh, where R1's pointing. So this is actually like some random linked list uh, lookup function, but it's actually looking down to that add instruction and loading it to R1, and then we write that to the object. And so um, at this point, it looks like this. Uh, it's pointing to something in user space, and then we just alloc two times. Uh, we can look in user space, oh, they put the object there. Uh, you control the V table, and from there, it's pretty much a uh, standard, straightforward thing. So uh, there we go. Got full R11 user space and kernel. And this is almost game over. One more time. So uh, we have broken several parts of the uh, 3DS firmware, including the 3DS kernel and uh, all the software that is running on uh, the security processor. Uh, what we haven't looked at yet are the 3DS boot rooms. And um, basically there's uh, one boot room for each processor, for the ARM11 and for the ARM9. And I think there's uh, probably there are more boot rooms in the 3DS system on the chip uh, used for uh, old Nintendo DS mode, but we will focus uh, on the 3DS boot rooms here. And what we know is they are uh, somehow loading the firmware image from uh, NAND flash. And um, we also know that the ARM9 boot room does uh, all the interesting stuff because only the ARM9 has uh, access to the uh, whole crypto hardware, like uh, AES engine, RSA engine. Uh, we also know that the boot room will initialize the secret keys uh, for the AES uh, key slots. And uh, yes, we would like to get those keys, uh, but in, uh, unfortunately, the boot room is uh, disabled. It disables itself. Um, before it's uh, launching the firmware. And 3DS um, boot rooms also print nice error screens. Like when the NAND is corrupted or something, it shows an error screen. So let's look uh, how the boot rooms are protected in detail. Um, basically, there are two registers that we call uh, config sysprot9 and sysprot11. And the boot room writes to those registers, and of course, they are one shot. You cannot re enable the boot rooms again because this is not the Wii U. And um, basically, when it uh, disables the boot room, it only disables uh, one half of it. So, what you get are uh, two parts of uh, boot room there's uh, the unprotected part and the protected part. Um, you can just dump the unprotected part um, by taking over a 9 from firmware, but 
you can never see the protected part. And they were really clever, and basically they put all the interesting code in the protected part. And if you look at the reset vector, it just jumps directly to the protected part of the boot room. So you can't really figure out what is going on when the 3DS is starting up. But what you can do is uh, you can look at the code from the unprotected boot room. And who knows, maybe we can find a bug. So let's do this. Uh, first of all, of course, there are no keys in, in the unprotected boot room. Uh, they put all the keys in the protected part. It's also mainly, uh, it's a lot of driver code. It talks to some hardware like NAND flash, MMC, uh, the AAS engine, and also to a spy flash, which is kind of interesting because the spy flash is some uh, really tiny um, chip that is soldered on the Wi Fi socket. And it's actually used for some Wi Fi settings and other user settings used by uh, old Nintendo DS mode. And yeah, that's kind of interesting. It uses this spy flash. And it also includes the ARM exception vector table. And this is actually a design that they have adopted from previous generations of the Nintendo DS, such as the DSi. Um, if you don't know ARM, um, basically you have something that is called an exception vector table. And this is located at uh, this hard-coded address in boot room. And basically, every time when something weird happens or something special uh, on the CPU, it will jump to those exception vectors, like um, the reset vector that we just saw, or uh, when you're trying to read from an invalid address, it will jump to the prefetch abort or data abort uh, vector. And also when you uh, receive an interrupt, it will jump to uh, the interrupt request vector. So um, those are the exception vectors, and they are hard-coded in the boot room, and there's kind of a problem with that, because as a developer, you don't want uh, to put the exception and the routines in the boot room. You want to be able to change the code, right? So um, what they do is they just redirect all the exception execution flow from boot room to another um, jump table that is located in ARM line memory. So it looks like this. Uh, what you can see here, uh, the boot room vectors, uh, it's basically just a jump instruction to the RAM vectors, and the RAM vectors are also just another um, jump instruction to the actual firmware handler. And this is how uh, things look like when the firmware is running. But what about cold boot? Well, on cold boot, you get this. And uh, this looks kind of interesting because uh, you have the boot run vectors that still point to uh, ARM9 memory. But since this is cold boot, uh, the RAM is not uh, initialized. So this is interesting, but it is, it's not really a bug because at some point, uh, the boot run will initialize those RAM vectors. So, but let's uh, cheat a little bit here and say, let's just assume we could somehow trigger a really early exception, even before uh, the boot room is able to initialize the RAM vectors. Well, probably it would just crash, because uh, on an exception, it would just jump to uninitialized memory, and there's probably no valid instruction there. So this is not very useful. But there's a really nice hardware flow, and uh, we found this by just writing to some memory reboot and see what, uh, what happened. And basically, we found out that some RAM is actually not cleared on reboot. And this also includes ARM9. So the basic idea is uh, we can set up some custom exception vectors in RAM that uh, redirect execution flow to some dumper code. So when we re reboot, we get this. And this is uh, really interesting, because if you look at this, this means all we need to do now is trigger a really early exception. And then the boot room will jump to our dumper code. 
So um, how can we trigger an exception? Well, if you look at the um, exception vector table again, there are some exceptions uh, that we can trigger, like uh, because they are hard coded, like uh, reset, and they would, won't jump to uh, online memory. And um, you also can use the interrupt vector because um, interrupts are disabled uh, on reset. And yeah, this won't work. So what is left is um, these three uh, interesting exceptions. And if you look at those, um, they normally don't happen, right? Uh, undefined instruction is really rare, and it shouldn't happen. So I don't know, but this reminds me kind of uh, like uh, it's a really nice uh, use case uh, for doing fault injection again, because you can corrupt registers and uh, get mut mutated instructions. So it's really likely that it will trigger an exception. So. This is the vector, vector glitch hack. Uh, basically, we set up some vectors in RAM, trigger reboot, then do some glitching magic, and then we reset again and let it boot up normally. And hopefully, uh, the damper code got executed and just wrote uh, a copy of the boot ROM in memory so we can just dump it. All this stuff is not very stable, but it works for me. So, okay, uh, we got the boot room, and Nintendo is losing a life there. So, uh, before we uh, look at uh, the boot, uh, boot room, I have a little prologue for you. And basically, in early uh, 2014, um, an FCC document be became public. Uh, there it is. And basically, it says that uh, Nintendo has changed the CPU of the Nintendo 2DS. And there's one really interesting sentence that basically says, um, they've changed the security function of the initial program loader that is installed in each mod uh, model. So the initial program loader is probably the boot ROM, so obviously there must be some really huge bug in the boot ROM, right? <laughs> so, so let's uh, look at uh, the boot ROM. Uh, basically, there are some boot methods. Um, you can boot from NAN, that's what it normally does, but alternatively, you can also boot from Spy Flash, which is a, a Wi Fi flash. And it will only boot uh, firmware images uh, that are signed and encrypted. There's no uh, freaky uh, development backdoor that we can exploit. It also uses uh, two different set of keys for. NAND on, and non-NAND boot methods, and also for Rita in dev mode. So even when stuff uh, gets leaked, you cannot use it on your Rita console. So let's do a small boot walkthrough. Um, it's pretty straightforward, actually. So the first thing it does is uh, it selects a boot device, then it loads the firmware header and the RSA signature from it. It's just one block, and then it hashes the um, header and extracts uh, the hash from the signature and compares it. So basically, uh, basic uh, signature verification, header verification. And then it assumes, yeah, uh, the header is safe, and then it starts loading uh, the firmware sections. And it's pretty, it's, the firmware image is a pretty simple format. Um, like you have some entries in the header that tells you, okay, take the data from this offset and there, there's a section with this size loaded to that address. It's yeah, pretty simple. So uh, we know from Nintendo's past uh, that they like to mess up RSA signature checks. So let's look at how RSA is done on 3DS. So for the 3DS firmware, um, they are using RSA signatures um, in the PKCS standard. Now, PKCS is basically a bunch of standards that tell, uh, tell you how your signatures have to look like. And they are using the 2048-bit version of RSA, which is safe. 
And um, in the signature, you have the uh, SHA-2 hash. And this is encoded using ASN1. And ASN1, it's uh, some really complex structure. It's basically, uh, it's similar to the uh, MP3 structure. So you have little chunks of data and those chunks have little headers and the headers have tag bytes and length bytes. And basically this ASN1 stuff is used uh, to tell the parser which um, hashing algorithm is used. And well, since the SHA-2 hash is only 20 hex bytes um, in size, um, you have some remaining space in the signature that you have to fill. And PKACS says you need the padding, and this padding should be deterministic. It should only contain FF bytes. So when you're trying to forge signatures, it's, it's really difficult because of this uh, padding that is really long. And when you compare uh, um, the signatures of different firmware images, you will actually notice that uh, only the hash will change. Uh, the rest of the data is always the same for all signatures. But, well, for some reason, they decided to write a signature parser for this stuff. So what you get now is RSA, the, the Nintendo way, <laughs> again. So um, the first thing it does is it tries to parse the padding, and this parser is totally messed up. Like, uh, there's a flag byte that tells you if the padding should be checked, and if it's one, then it is checked, it should be all FF bytes, but if it's two, then it will just skip the padding. And um, it also has some really weak bounds checking it. Make sure that it will not, um, when it's passing the padding, it makes sure that it will not go out of bounds, but um, they forget to verify that uh, the hash uh, will actually fit in there as well. So the um, next thing they do is parsing this really complicated as in one structure. And there, this parser is also really simplified. So um, we know ASN1 has some length fields and there's no bounds checking. So uh, eventually it will um, add the length to uh, the current pointer in the signature. And then they stop parsing and say, okay, we parsed all the data and now uh, there should be the hash. And yeah, they are not checking this length and this, this point is used to do uh, the hash comparison. So all in all, you can say um, it only checks a few bytes in the signature because uh, the padding parser is messed up and also the ASM1 parser is really simplified. So what we can do is we can brute force a perfect signature where the final pointer, when it's done uh, parsing the padding and the ASM1 data, that this final pointer matches the pointer of the calculated hash of the boot from. So what it... Uh, what it does then is it does a mem copy, uh, a mem compare uh, with the calculated hash and the calculated hash. Like, uh, and this never fails, right? So it will always succeed. And this is sick hacks. Uh, So SIGHEX is uh, a bootroom exploit for 3DS, and basically we can sign our own firmwares, and there are over 60 million vulnerable devices. And basically, a new 3DS and 2DS, basically all models are affected. And of course, since this is the bootroom, Nintendo can't fix it. <laughs> so that's pretty nice, uh, but there's one heart remaining, so Something is missing. What we haven't done yet is, um, we haven't dumped uh, the ARM11 boot from. Uh, it's probably not really interesting, but for the sake of completeness, uh, you would like to get it. <laughs> and um, 
In theory, we can just do a vector glitch hack again because it has the same flaw. But now that we can sign our own firmware, let's try something else. So um, if you look at the unprotected part of the ARM11 boot ROM, you can see there are a lot of references to ARM11 memory. So maybe now that we can sign our own firmware and we can set up our own firmware sections, maybe we can overwrite some boot ROM data. So, but they, uh, the boot ROM developers were kind of clever and the ARM line boot ROM checks the firmware sections and they have some kind of blacklist and unfortunately you can't um, just overwrite uh, boot nine data sections. But uh, for some reason, they forgot to blacklist all the boot 11 data regions. So you can just overwrite uh, boot 11 stack or the exception vectors and well, you can dump the ARM11 boot ROM. Yeah, that was pretty easy. And um, now I get to tell you something. Um, all this stuff about the boot ROM, uh, we did this in summer uh, 2015. So we could have talked about this uh, already last year, but since we are kind of uh, friendly hackers, we um, hold this bug so long. So yeah, Nintendo should be thankful. <laughs> And um, okay, so that's it. Three years, three game over. And here's a picture of Nintendo Switch. And our buddy is <laughs> already. Thank you very much. There's uh, about five minutes left for questions. Um, are there any questions from the internet? No? None? Hello? Hello? Okay. Yes, uh, there's actually one question from the internet, and uh, that is um, the internet wants to know if we can get uh, DSP code execution maybe sometime soon. Can you repeat the question? It's yeah. very hard to understand here. Okay. Um, the internet wants to know if we can get uh, DSP code execution. Uh, well, the DSP of the 3DS runs its uh, own firmware, and that is included in some uh, kernel module. And basically, when you can sign uh, your own firmware, you can also make it uh, load uh, another DSP firmware. So yes, you can do this. Okay, people who are leaving, please do so quietly, and people entering also, do, please do so quietly. There was a question in the microphone three, I think, but no longer. Okay. Um, does the internet have more questions? Yes, it does. Um, the internet wants to know if you, uh, or how you uh, glitch the Wii U to get uh, execution. Uh, well, I don't want to uh, reveal how I did it in detail, but uh, there are some basic uh, fault injection attacks. And my setup was, I think, kind of complicated. You had to uh, modify a lot of stuff uh, on the Wii U main board to get it work. So I guess you have to figure it out yourself, sorry. <laughs> Okay, there's a question that's upstairs, microphone five, I think. Seven, but it's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you said that you broke all the 2DS, but actually you showed that the 2DS changed in the boot process. So did you verify that that worked for the first version as well? Uh, yes, um, so the new 3DS was released uh, after the 2DS, and the new 3DS is also vulnerable. And uh, basically all the Nintendo 2DS uh, consoles are also, uh, also vulnerable as well. Uh, yes, we did verify this, and 
we don't really know what uh, this uh, FCC document is about. Mm -hmm. um, we got some really uh, new uh, 2DS uh, from store. Um, and basically, there's no difference uh, for the boot room at all. So yes, everything is vulnerable. <laughs> nice to know. Thanks. OK. <laughs> Final question for microphone three. Yeah, just a fun question out of interest. When you're going to buy such a device, do you also plan to play game on it? Or is it just going to check if the, how the kernel works? Personally, for the Wii U, I own zero games, so. <laughs> Great, thanks. I also didn't pirate any, so I, I never played a game on my Wii U. <laughs>